I think we all know what it is like to feel alone and rejected. We know what it's like to feel like we belong, to feel connected. And my guess is we all have experienced some kind of wounding or hurt from community at some point in our lives. And the question becomes, how then do we find the courage and the strength to rise above our wounds and be able to create a community where all are truly welcome, to create a place where we can be together? Wolf says that Christ's answer to this is a scandal and one that is not easy to live. This week, we're diving in. If you take away the love of enemy, you have actually unchristianed the Christian faith. There's a somewhat famous cartoon that deals with justice, looking at the lenses of equity and equality. And the idea is you come to a baseball game and you're different heights and you're trying to see over the fence to see the game. And if you give everybody of differing heights a crate to stand on, some of them will be able to see, but some of them still will not be able to. And the idea is to get equality of having all the same does not necessarily get over the barrier so that everybody can have what is wanted, a look at the baseball game. The idea is for the tallest one, for instance, to take their crate and pass it along down so that somebody else has two. And the idea in that kind of a picture is we can arrange things equitably so that everybody can be able to see the game. Now, one of the things that that points out strongly is social arrangement. How do we arrange the goods so that people have the most equality? But what Wolf is most interested in dealing with is a more difficult question in my eyes. How do we create a person who is willing to give up their crate to another person? And not only that, but how do we create someone who is willing to give up their crate to someone else in the context of a world where there is someone standing right there and right there waiting to steal that extra crate from the weak party on the other end? How do we create the kind of person in that circumstance who is willing to give something up themselves for somebody else that might not work anyway? I think that's the heart of what Wolf is bringing out, and that's the heart of what we're going to look at in the introduction this week. Now, when I begin at that point and I talk about how do we be the kind of people who rise above, you may think that that means that Wolf is not aware of systemic injustice, but that is not the case at all. He's very well versed in the ways that the systems that we create as humans create oppression and create injustice. But as he works through these reflections and he looks at the struggle, he realizes that one of the keys is to also focus on the person, on social agents on how we create the kind of people who can envision systems that are just and work to bring them about. How do we create the kind of people who have the courage and the moral strength to reform structures and end the retribution cycle? Because if we can't do that, all we are doing is changing the social arrangement of who has power and who does not. Wolf is bringing us into the issue of reconciliation and conflict through the lens of ethnic conflict in his native Croatia. And I wonder if you might just take a second to think about what's the lens for you? What are the issues for you that get you thinking about how to reform injustice, how to change the structures that we live in? Okay, so now we're getting into actually reading the book. I think what I'll do is just sort of work my way through uh, section by section and just sort of talk about the things that I think are the main themes and pull out any things that I think might be uh, important for you as you enter into the reading. And I hope that I'll give a kind of framework and make it easier for you to read whatever the assignment is for the given week. So Wolf dives right in in the introduction to try to get to the heart of what his book is about. He wants to focus on identity and otherness and the ways that those help and make it difficult to live in peace and justice with each other. And so he, start, he begins by talking on page 16 about the first time that he crossed into the Croatian border after Croatia had declared its independence. And he writes about how it used to be in Yugoslavia you had to almost apologize for being a Croat, but now he felt this sense of identity and this sense of homecoming and I belong and these are my people and these are the ones that I belong with. It's that sense of identity with a group, a sense of belonging that is so essential that we all long for in so many ways. But he began to notice that there is a negative side to that. He said, 
I sensed an unexpressed expectation to explain why, as a Croat, I still had friends in Serbia and did not talk with disgust about the backwardness of their Byzantine Orthodox culture. And what he's getting at here is as we find a sense of identity with a particular group, as we find our niche and our people that we're connected to, there immediately becomes this tension expressed by the group to reject all others, all outsiders. Our identity is opposed to the other. And he says, the new Croatia, like some jealous goddess, wanted all my love and loyalty. I must be Croat through and through, or I was not a good Croat. And he starts to recognize that maybe this is a way that the Serbians didn't just take some of their soil, but also took some of their soul by demanding this sort of jealousy, this identity, this sense of only this and not the other. When he gets to page 18, he talks about how others frame around several themes about what rights are, justice is, and ecological well-being. Those are the places that the authors before him have centered their discussion about justice and reconciliation. And he's making the argument that there should be a fourth. There should be room for the fourth that he wants to put, he wants to put into the equation, identity and otherness. And he's recognizing in the course of this that this theme is so essential. We need to find identity. We need to find a sense of belonging. But we need to figure out how to do that without making that close us off from the other. Make it opposed, identity opposed to otherness. When we get to page 20 of the introduction, that's where Wolf is beginning to enter the discussion that I did earlier in the video with the uh, cartoon and the difference between equity and uh, equality. He recognizes that so many people who've gone before have talked about the social arrangements that we place ourselves in. And what he wants to really focus on is social agents, people, us, how we act and how we be people who can act justly. Bottom of page 20, he says, instead of reflecting on the kind of society we ought to create in order to accommodate our differences, I will explore what kind of selves we need to be in order to live in harmony with others. And he talks about how theologians should concentrate less on social arrangements and more on fostering the kind of social agents capable of envisioning and creating just, truthful, and peaceful societies and on shaping a cultural climate in which such agents will thrive. So again, he's not leaving out the social structures and the way that we are impacted, but he is focusing on how do we be the kind of people who can envision and create those, those uh, structures. Christ following social agents are then able to, as we are changed by Christ in his method, uh, we're able then to work on the social arrangements and have the strength to be able to do that. How do you not get molded, though, by unjust social arrangements yourself? Obviously, sometimes we do. Many times we do. We get molded and um, warped by unjust social arrangements that we live in. But what Wolf will continually point us back to and what he's going to hit really hard in this next section on page 22 and 23 is to focus on the cross. The cross not just as an idea, not just as something that happened in history, but a way of life and an encounter with the divine that actually brings transformation to us. We must internalize the cross, take up the cross, and to be transformed. We find our identity and power in the one who submitted to oppression without succumbing to being an oppressor. And that becomes the key for Wolf in how Christ died on the cross and was resurrected. He was able to identify with those who were oppressed, but not become an oppressor himself. And that both unlocks and uh, makes a way forward for our transformation, and it also serves as our example as we interact with people in the world. So when we get to page 23, what Wolf is drawing out is that central to the message of the cross, central to Jesus' mission in the world, is both solidarity, solidarity with victims and also atonement for the oppressors. Those two things together that come together at the heart of the cross are essential then for Wolf's way of dealing with justice, a Wolf's way of understanding identity and otherness. Page 23. The theme of solidarity with the victims 
is supplemented by the theme of atonement for the perpetrators. Just as the oppressed must be liberated from the suffering caused by oppression, so the oppressors must be liberated from the injustice committed through oppression. What Christ has done and is doing, and what we must figure out how to do to make a world that is more just, is not only to identify with those who are oppressed, but to bring transformation and atonement for the oppressors as well. And always holding out that sense of hope for the other, even when the other is the oppressor or the enemy. And what Wolf does is root that in God's very self, the way that God also emptied God's self to make space for us in order then to be able to bring us into right relationship. Just as God, on the bottom of page 23, does not abandon the godless to their evil, but gives the divine self for them in order to receive them into divine communion through atonement, so also should we, whoever our enemies and whoever we may be. And this really is the heart of Wolf's argument. It is God's very self and God's very nature that is the root of how he's going to look at justice and reconciliation in the world. And the way that he sees God portrayed all throughout the Bible is God is a self-giving God who will not leave us abandoned on our own. God is a self-giving God who takes the risk to make space within God's self for us to enter into the divine communion. And as God does this, he is setting us both the power to be those kind of people ourselves and the example for how we should be. So for us to truly follow God, we must model our lives after that, to be ones who are self-giving in order to bring others in and make space for others to be in communion and relationship with us. This becomes the key and the heart of how to work for justice and reconciliation. As we move forward in the introduction and we get to pages 24 and 25, we try to get to the place where Wolf, following the Christian perspective to get at reconciliation, brings us to some real difficulties in accepting, I think. Because we live in circles, I think, where we who desire justice um, can struggle with some of what the Christian message is all about. Let me give you an example of what I mean. On page 24, one of the things that uh, Wolf is exploring is solidarity and what that means. Solidarity is an important word when you are fighting uh, oppression. And often there is the idea of solidarity with, solidarity with those who are oppressed. And what Wolf wants to argue, if we're going to approach this from a Christian's perspective, is that solidarity must be a sub-theme of self-giving love. In other words, Solidarity is not the most important goal. The most important goal as a Christian is to model ourselves after God and have that sense of self-giving love. And in doing that, we then are pursuing solidarity just as God does. We're pursuing a connection with others as a sub-theme of us, giving ourselves in order for others to have love. Now what is really profound is that Wolf wants to say that solidarity is suffering together with rather than struggling on the side of. And he says that solidarity cannot be severed, cannot be cut off from self-donation. And this is huge when I think about the landscape of how many in this world right now are approaching oppression. There is a strong desire because of how awful the world is right now to fight on behalf of those who need it. And I understand it and I feel that myself. But Wolf is pulling us back and reminding us that if we are truly going to root this in the heart of God, look at what God did in Christ. And solidarity as this subset of God's self-giving love means always leaving room for the atonement of the one that we see as enemy. It means to be willing instead of to fight on behalf of to do as Christ did and suffer with, suffer alongside. And I fully expect that this is one of the places where we will see some tension in our discussion, where there will be some that this will be difficult to take. And Wolf recognizes that it's there as well, because when we move on to page 25, we see him use the word scandal, and he connects it directly to the cross. The scandal exactly in how God worked through allowing Jesus to die on the cross. 
He puts the scandal in black and white on page 26. The ultimate scandal of the cross is the all too frequent failure of self donation to bear positive fruit. You give yourself for the other, and violence does not stop but destroys you. You sacrifice your life and you stabilize the power of the perpetrator. And one of the things I appreciate about Wolf being so direct and so black and white about this is to help us recognize as we are working through this entire book that he sees the scandal of this. He sees the struggle of this. This is not someone who is blind to the inequities of the world. He's had them face to face his entire life as he's grown up and seen what's happened with Croats and Serbs and in many other ways. But as a follower of Christ, as one who is taking up the cross, there is a scandal to this. There is a difficulty in recognizing that when we follow this way, when we suffer on behalf of others, all too often in this world, it doesn't work and can even stabilize the power of the perpetrator. So one of the things that I love is Wolf is just very direct and upfront. Is this scandal enough then to give up on the way of the cross. If we can bluntly see that it sometimes increases the power of the perpetrator, should we just give it up? And he just lays it out there. He says, no, we can't do that and remain Christian because this is the heart of the Christian faith. We cannot give up on the cross. We cannot give up on this solidarity and self-giving love that makes space for the other if we want to remain followers of Jesus Christ. One of the things that I have thought of quite a bit um, with the difficulties that have happened within the church over the last several years, I think about those who, because of what they have seen and the injustices they have seen uh, happen, how they have themselves given up a bit on faith in Christ. And I wonder what we could have done differently, what we can do differently now to be a little bit more blunt as Wolf is about the scandal of what it means to be a follower of Christ about the scandal of this way of life that identifies with and joins in the suffering of the oppressed, but does not always use power to fight on the side of. I wonder if we need to be a little more blunt and honest about how often this way of Christianity, this way of following Christ, doesn't practically and tangibly work in the world that we live in. But we do this because we are holding out the hope of resurrection. We do this because we see this as the heart of God, the way that God interacted with us. We do this because we see if we need to get ourselves out of this cycle of violence and not just change the people who are in charge and oppressing, if we truly want to break it, that it takes what Christ has done to suffer with the oppressed and in doing that find resurrection and healing for them while at the same time leaving space open because we have not committed power moves for those who are the oppressors and the perpetrators to be healed and transformed as well. Jesus' resurrection is the first and most powerful vindication of this way of life. It is the anticipatory hope for us that this is going to be the final word. God's action of resurrection and power through this way is the way that is going to make the difference to break the cycle of injustice in our world. The heart of this book is right here in the introduction. If you want to sum it up, it's on page 29. This is what the whole rest of the book is going to be about. We must be willing to embrace the other. We must be willing to make space for the other, even the other who is the enemy, even the other who is the oppressor, even the other who is the perpetrator of wrongs done to us. If we are going to break the cycle of retribution and violence and follow Christ as he has lived, then we must always be open to embrace. The will to give ourselves to others and welcome them to readjust our identities to make space for them. That is prior to any judgment about others except that of identifying them in their humanity. The will to embrace precedes any truth about others and any construction of their justice. The will to embrace is absolutely indiscriminate and strictly immutable. 
In other words, we maintain a will to embrace the other that is not dependent in any way or affected in any way by their actions, simply because of their humanity, their value as a human being, we must remain willing to embrace the other. That is the heart of Wolf's book. Now he will go on, we will look in the weeks ahead about all of the qualifications to that. Um, there is a waiting for some reciprocalness before you enter into relationship. But the key to all of this, the key to being a person who follows Christ and is working for reconciliation and to overturn this cycle of retribution and violence and injustice, is for each of us to find the way to have the will to embrace the other, no matter who they are, no matter what they have done. Making space for others in our lives is key. There is no truth and justice without embrace. We'll talk as well later on about how there can be no embrace without truth and justice as well. But Wolf is going to push us to begin with this will to embrace. Now, I fully expect that this is going to be, as we come to really understand what Wolf is saying, as we come to therefore grapple with these parts of our faith and what it, mean that Christ, what it means that Christ has died on the cross, there's going to be tension here. There's going to be difficulty in recognizing, but what about, but what about? But I want us to grapple with this difficulty right at the beginning and name it as clearly as Wolf has. There is a sense where the Christian message of the cross is a scandal. There is a sense where pursuing justice in this way of identifying with the oppressed and suffering with, but leaving open the possibility of reconciliation of the oppressors. There's the reality that in this world that can lead to continued oppression. But what we hold on to is the idea that resurrection and the, the nature of God this offers us a different way out of breaking the cycles of the worlds that we live in so that it's not just replacing who gets to be in charge and who gets to oppress, but actually comes to the place of true reconciliation and peace. That's the journey we're on. I recognize we're not all going to agree. In fact, I hope that we don't because these are the kind of discussions that I think are going to pull out really important things for us in how we live, in how we act, in how we understand what Christ has done. So this is the introduction. I hope you'll be able to enjoy it. Read the introduction, give questions, we'll come together. I hope that this is going to be a great discussion.